Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, the third in the Edge of Risk series, sponsored by Stanford Hospital and Clinics Risk Consulting. And before we start, Dr. Beecham, I'd like to confirm you're on the line with us. I am indeed, and happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And Dr. Sobel would also like to confirm you're on the line with us. I'm right over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brad Brigleb, and I'm the Senior Director of Claims and Litigation Strategy at Stanford University Medical Center. Today's topic is restructuring informed consent in an era of health system reform. Our audience today is a mix of Stanford University Medical Center practitioners and staff, as well as members of other organizations from all around the country. I want to thank all of you for joining with us today. A few comments about today's webinar, which will be interactive in two ways. First, we'll be conducting polls for your opinions on various topics during the webinar. Polling options are located on the right lower panel of your screen. You'll be prompted to respond and notified when the polls close. Second, you may at any time throughout the webinar submit questions via the Q&A feature. We will be collecting all questions and addressing them at the end of the webinar. You should also receive a link to download the webinar toolkit. The toolkit includes the informed consent white paper, checklist, and policy framework guidance. Please be sure to download these documents. If you do not receive a link or are having trouble downloading the documents, please notify us of the Q&A feature. And lastly, we'd like to take a brief moment to review our disclaimer, which is located on the screen. The opinions expressed, discussions undertaken, and materials provided as part of this presentation do not represent any official position of Stanford University or any of its affiliates, including Stanford University Medical Center, its faculty, staff, or employees. But let's have a brief overview of today's discussion. Uh, as everyone would agree, we're certainly living in an era of health care reform. This doesn't just relate to who health care is provided to or how it's paid for, but specific to today's topic, it also deals with how treatment decisions are made between physicians and patients. We see on the federal level uh, various developments providing for shared medical decision making. We also see that there has been funding and testing for the use of decision aids. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also have significant movement across state legislatures towards mandating shared decision making in the process of obtaining informed consent. And also, as exemplified by the Institute of Medicine, there's been wide recognition that quality in modern health care really does involve patient-centeredness and fostering of mutual respect and participation of physicians and patients in the medical decision making. And that's specific to today's topic, as we see and discuss the reconstruction that's happening in both the theory and the practice of informed consent. Uh, let me now move to introduce our speakers. We've brought together three eminent experts to discuss this culture shift and the reconstruction of the informed consent process. First, we're honored to have a renowned American philosopher and bioethicist, Dr. Tom Beecham, with us today. Dr. Beecham's calling in from Massachusetts, where he serves as a professor of philosophy and senior research scholar at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University. Welcome to you, Dr. Beecham. My pleasure. We're also very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Clarence Braddock. Dr. Braddock is here with us in Palo Alto, California. Dr. Braddock is Professor of Medicine and Associate Dean for Medical Education at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Braddock serves as the Medical Director of Quality at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. He is also Director of Clinical Ethics at the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Braddock. Pleasure to be here, Brad. And finally, we have the pleasure of having Dr. David Sobel call with, uh, in with us today. Dr. Sobel is calling in from Colorado. Dr. Sobel is a practicing urologic surgeon, and he serves as chief, as chief medical officer of Emmy Solutions. Emmy Solutions is an innovative company he has co-founded, which provides multimedia decision aids for patient education and engagement in medical decision making. Welcome also to you, Dr. Sobel. Thank you. It's, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, we'd like to take a, just a brief moment to address any possible conflicts of interest. Uh, you see on your screen, uh, it's worth noting that Dr. Braddock serves on the Board of Directors of the Foundation for Informed Decision Making, though Stanford has no formal affiliation with that organization. And in relation to Dr. Sobel, while Stanford has an industry relationship with Emmy, his participation in this webinar is solely an educational collaboration on a topic of mutual interest. None of our speakers have been financially compensated for the participation in this webinar, and indeed, we are very grateful to have them with all, all of them with us today. All right, before we begin our discussion, we'd like to know a little bit more about our participants. 
Uh, using the options at the lower right panel of your screen, please pick the response that best describes your background. Are you a physician, a registered nurse, a healthcare risk management professional, an attorney, a hospital administrator, or do you serve in some other capacity uh, in the healthcare field? We know that typically informed consent is a, a conversation that goes on specifically between a physician and a patient. But we also know in the modern era there are a lot of different individuals who can be involved in that process. We know there are many who have involvement in the process of, if we're using decision aids. We also know patients are commonly going to ask um, their nurses, for example, information and questions that they might not ask the physician. So we just want to get a full view. Is that an idea of just everybody who's participating in with us? And we're closing in a moment. And as we can see, most of us here um, are, in fact, healthcare risk management in the management professional side. We also have a number of different individuals from other groups. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to turn to our learning objectives today. By the end of this webinar, we hope all of you will be able to have a better understanding of the history and philosophy of informed consent and the, the tension that exists between legal and ethical standards. Uh, second, we want to make sure we have an appreciation of the difficulties faced by all medical practitioners and the patients in navigating a medical decision-making format and achieving a true informed consent. Third, we ought to be able to recognize the value of shared decision-making as a tool to assist and enhance the process of, of obtaining informed consent. And finally, we'd like to hope, we hope everybody can recognize those opportunities to use shared decision-making tools, techniques, and resources in the practice setting. All right, let's begin our discussion today with Dr. Beecham. Dr. Beecham is going to help us examine the fundamentals of informed consent and this tension we've discussed already between what law and ethics demand and how practitioners um, and healthcare organizations can align their practices with the highest ideals of informed consent. So, Dr. Beecham, let's uh, start with you. And, Dr. Beecham, if you wouldn't mind, we just want to have you speak up uh, since you are calling all the way from Massachusetts. And we'd like to start with you about the, just the basics of informed consent. Now, I know as an attorney, I often just assume that I have an understanding of the concept that's the same as everybody else. But that's not necessarily true. So let's start with just defining it. What is informed consent? Well, Brad, I put it in very simple terms to begin with, at least minimal number of terms. Um, an informed consent is an autonomous authorization. If it's in a practice context, it's the autonomous authorization of a patient. If it's in a research context, it's the autonomous authorization of a research subject. Now, to authorize means to allow to go forward in this context. And autonomous means it really is an act of self-determination on the part of the patient. It's not just signing a form or something of that sort. So to put it briefly, the patient authorizes a physician to proceed. Now, as is shown on slide 14, we do need to distinguish between an ethically valid informed consent and a legal. Dr. Beecham, I wonder if we could have you speak up uh, just uh, very closely to your, your phone so we can hear you a little bit better. Uh, okay. Um, maybe I'll raise the voice Much a little better. Bit. Is that somewhat better? Much okay. better. Thank you. Okay, so we're making a distinction between ethically valid informed consent and legally effective informed consent. An ethically valid informed consent means that there's a conformity in what the physician does in interacting with the patient to moral standards. The legally effective informed consent means there's a conformity to legal standards or perhaps to institutional standards. As in slide 15, let's start by analyzing what an ethically valid informed consent is in a little bit more detail. First of all, as I say, it's patient autonomy, often said to be in the literature, a patient making a meaningful choice. Here's the things to take seriously are the idea of autonomy. It really is an expression of autonomy on the part of the patient, not just getting something out of the patient by the physician. And it's meaningful. It's meaningful to the patient, and it actually is a meaningful consent. That can be a problem for many physicians because, particularly in the history of medicine, as we'll come to in a moment, autonomy has often held much lower esteem among physicians than beneficence. That is to say, the idea of getting a patient to be self-determining and making medical choices 
has been considered to be much less important than maximizing the utility and protecting the patient's health, or what time, sometimes is called medical beneficence. Morally, when it comes to informed consent, autonomy is everything. Now, that doesn't mean to say in medical practice autonomy is everything, but when it comes to an informed consent, the weight has to be laid completely on the side of autonomy. To go on now to slide 16, you can also ask what is a legally effective informed consent. That is a context in which either legal requirements, that is to say those laid down by legislatures, courts, and the like, or institutional requirements compel you to proceed in a certain way. For example, an institution might use a particular consent form, and that's the only form that would actually validate the consent in that context. Traditionally, in law, the focus has been on information disclosure, that is, disclosing information to the patient. And this has traditionally meant a type of information, for example, disclosing about risks. It has not traditionally meant quality of disclosure, something that physicians and courts continue to struggle with as to how to get into questions of quality. To go now to slide 17, we can ask, what is an informed consent in the right model that would work, I think, for both morals and law? In fact, I think there's a lot of consensus at the present time in certain circles of both ethics and law that this is correct. And these are certain elements of an ethically valid informed consent. A couple of threshold elements are obvious. You can't get an informed consent unless you've got a person who's competent to make the decision that has to be made and is in a context in which they are voluntary in deciding whatever it is that they decide. Uh, voluntariness is a complicated concept, but basically it means you can't be manipulated or coerced or in a context in which you don't make a free choice. Now, much more important are the middle elements in this slide 17 so-called information elements. There's disclosure, the traditional one in law, which pretty much means disclosure of alternatives, risks, benefits, and anything else that's a material piece of information to the patient. And then one that's often dropped out of sight is the recommendation of a plan. Recommendation of a plan can be the most critical element of getting an informed consent because it's the piece of information that the patient most wants. What is the doctor recommending for me. And then finally, the patient has to understand. There has to be real understanding. Traditionally in law, rather little attention was paid to understanding, a lot of attention paid to disclosure. That's beginning to turn around, but it still is in a process of turning around. And finally, there are the so-called consent elements. There has to be a decision in favor of a plan, whatever the plan is that's been constructed, and then there has to be an authorization that allows the, the physician to go forward. If you don't have these elements in place in an informed consent context, you are not getting an informed consent. All right, so we can go, I think, to the next slide. And Brad, I believe you wanted to introduce a new subject. Dr. Meacham, thank you. I'm fascinated by the, the slide we just talked about, which sets forth um, really what the practice should be and what's entailed in actually obtaining a good informed consent. What I'm fascinated by is how the law has developed around the idea of informed consent. So my next question for you is how did we end up with this legal or institutional bias, if you will, in the notion of informed consent? All right. Let's start not with a piece of legal history per se, but a piece of the history of medicine because it informs why the law took the course that it did. As a matter of fact, there has been a deep paternalistic history in medicine that needs to be framed in a certain way. There's a quote on slide 19 from the late Bill Curran, who I think had it exactly right. He says, from the point of view of physicians, the most important obligations to the patient are, first, to do no harm, that was the traditional Hippocratic teaching, and then, secondly, the benefit side, which is to put forward the best efforts to provide comfort, care, healing, and that sort of thing. Now, the critical part of this quote from, from Curran, he says, all other issues are seen by physicians as minor components 
That's very interesting. It, it may be a little bit strong, what he says, but traditionally it was true. There was no other element that was anywhere in the class of do no harm and provide benefit. So the history of informed consent in the law picks up on that context. Let's go to the next slide, which is slide uh, 20. The legal history in the 20th century. In the, the Dr. Beecham, history. if I could, just a reminder just to speak up, um, that would be really good. Thank you. Okay, I'm probably doing about the best I can with this particular okay. phone. Well, here's our test of technology, so we'll go forward. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, in, the 20th, in the early 20th century, we were in a context in which uh, non-consensual treatment, that was a treatment that was not consented to, came forward in several cases as battery. So the physician was considered to be battering the patient in that um, that form of legal action. Then in the 1950s and the 1960s, this was turned around a bit. The idea of battery receded in the background, and it was reconstructed as a failure to meet professional standards. That is to say it was negligence. Just like any other kind of medical negligence, if you don't provide adequate information, the patient makes a bad decision or a harmful decision based on it, then you're negligent. Uh, that view is still around and still around very strongly. Now, the, the, the ground began to shift even further to real informed consent as we know it today around 1957 in a case that involved the Stanford University Board of Trustees known as Salgo v. Stanford University. There were um, uh, important elements of that case that, that began to bring forward what in detail you had to disclose in order to get an informed consent. So risks and alternatives and benefits and options and so on um, were all put forward as essential to informed consent. Now, another thing not to forget in understanding the legal history is that there were, especially in the 19 60s and 1970, very important um, historical pieces of background consideration. For example, individual liberty and social equality came forward in a way in which they never had before in American history, what we, what we think of now encapsulating as the civil rights movement. Medicare came along in 1965. Medicare is constructed basically as a form of social justice and the social justice movement. Then there was the development of the field of bioethics, which really only starts around 1970. There was no bioethics prior to that. Um, and that put forward a new set of standards for the moral scrutiny of medicine. Um, and also in the context in the 60s and 70s was uh, increasingly technological and impersonal medical care that, felt to be, that began to be acutely felt in society. There also at that time were many concerns about medical experimentation and the use of non-validated practices by physicians. All of this conspired to bring forward a number of legal cases and new standards of informed consent. Um, moving to slide 21, there were many questions also about what and how much information should be disclosed that began to be discussed in, this, in these cases. And the law began to erect what were considered general standards for what doctors should disclose and how they should interact with patients. In the 50s and the 60s, the professional practice standard dominated. That means basically a doctor has to disclose information, provide information that a reasonably prudent practitioner in the same field would disclose. That's generally considered a doctor protective standard when it comes to law cases. In the 1970s, there came to the foreground, uh, particularly in California, the District of Columbia, and Rhode Island, but then it spread nationally, the reasonable person standard, where the standard is the information that would be material to any reasonable patient confronted with this decision. That's been widely considered a patient protective standard or something based on what we earlier discussed as autonomy. However, to move to very quickly to slide 22, the better standard morally is without doubt the information that is material to the individual patient. Not what doctors generally do, not what a reasonable person might expect, but what this particular individual patient expects. And this is generally called a subjective standard. Um, now, Brad, I think you wanted to introduce the next subject. 
Yes, Dr. Beacham, thank you. I, I'm fascinated again from a, as, a, as an attorney. The, the clearly is a significant difference between what the law provides and what ethics demands. So I'd like to turn now to have you discuss this emphasis of legal concept. How well is it serving patients and physicians? And how do we reconcile this apparent conflict between the two ideologies, if you will? Yeah, I don't think there's so much of a difference of ideology as people often perceive. People feel threatened by the law. They don't feel so threatened by moral. There's a million things that we could bring forward. Uh, but I think actually the conception of an informed consent, what an informed consent is, has over the course of the last 40 years become to be almost identical in law and morals. Now, there are different considerations. The law is not morals. I mean, the law centers on um, a number of uh, particular notions, and that, that takes us on to uh, slide number 24. The law focuses primarily on disclosure and illegal conduct, what I referred to uh, uh, malpractice earlier, and liability. Though that's what the law turns on. Now, ethics turns on disclosure, too. It doesn't turn on illegal conduct and liability. It turns on responsibility rather than liability, but that's a different kind of notion. So the three central notions featured here in slide number 24 is that ethics focuses principally on the quality of understanding, which is, uh, as I said earlier, uh, never been taken as seriously as it should have been in law, then on what the physician ought to do, or perhaps also what the context ought to be in which a discussion occurs, and then it focus on the rights and needs of patients. What's slightly misleading about this diagram, the diagram you see in, in slide number 24, is now in medicine and law, as well as ethics, those three elements on the right side are beginning to be taken much, much more seriously. The easiest place to find this is in academic analysis. In other words, what happens by uh, uh, professors of ethics, professors of law, professors of medicine who study these issues and then write about them is remarkably similar these days. All right, let's move on to slide number um, 25. This is about what are some remaining concerns about the effects in practice and maybe areas in which we need to improve. First of all, the, the law is a kind of distraction from morals. It always has been and it continues to be. And that's unfortunate because the law basically defines that which is minimally necessary conduct, not that which is morally worthy uh, conduct. Um, secondly, receiving insufficient information remains the highest source of patient dissatisfaction in their interactions with physicians. We've known this for a long, long time, and we've gotten better at it, uh, but we're just not that good at it yet for any number of reasons. Third, there remains inadequate respect for decisional authority of patients. That's been showed in empirical study after empirical study. There's way too much thinking about consenting a patient and getting it over with and a far too low a priority in many institutions on getting a real informed consent. And there still also can be ethically unacceptable but legally effective consent to treatment. That is to say, the standards are so low in institutions that it's a legally effective and institutionally acceptable consent, but it's not an ethically acceptable consent. So we have a long way to go. Now, Brad, back to you. So, Dr. Beecham, thank you. Um, I can see again, interesting, how there is often what appears to be a conflict between the legal and ethical concepts, but there doesn't have to be. So, um, I'd like to next ask you to give us a brief comment on how would you recommend practitioners and institutions shape the informed consent discussion with patients so that they might actually meet the legal standard, but also meet the ethical obligations? Brad, here's, what, here's where I would lay the emphasis. Um, first, real dialogue. Many physicians are just not used to this. They're not particularly well trained. In fact, many of them are not trained at all to do it in the course of their medical training or in the institutions where they are. Um, time is certainly a factor, but we're not considering that time in talking about what an informed consent is. And informed consent requires 
real discussion and, and, and dialogue between the patient and the physician. Then there's the question of comprehension and understanding. I think many physicians have long had the view that patients just can't understand. It's too technical, uh, and moreover, it's almost impossible to understand when the patient understands, that is to say, to know when they understand. I think that's very, very wrong. I know you're going to talk more about this later. We now have lots of aids to understanding, and there are just many, many ways to test as to whether or not a patient understands through the course of conversation. Then third, we really need to assure that a context is one in which a patient is not hassled, set upon by family, bewildered by the medical context, so that what they do actually is voluntary on their part. And then in the second part of this slide 27, the language of shared decision-making, which I know you will make much more of later, uh, that is really, really critical. It, um, it has surfaced as perhaps the most important notion to frame what physicians should be doing with patients. One thing I would note about it is that shared decision-making should be understood as a process of obtaining an informed consent. It is not a definition of informed consent, as has been put forward in, in uh, some parts of the informed consent literature. In other words, this is the context in which a physician should be interacting with a patient by making a decision in a shared way. But the patient, in the end, has to be the person who makes that decision, the final decision, and authorization. And finally, um, as in the last line, good law is, I think, based on good ethics. And I have never met anyone who's really familiar with the history of informed consent and context of informed consent who didn't think that was the case. All right, Brad, back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Beecham. That, that really has given us a very good foundational beginning on this concept of both legal and ethical notions that make up informed consent and how we can connect the two concepts rather than having them in conflict. So for our audience, I'd like to switch now to following up on Dr. Beecham and have our second polling question for you today. What do you think is the greatest challenge in obtaining legally and ethically valid informed consent in practice? Uh, we know there are many challenges faced um, by the practitioner and the patient. Dr. Braddock's going to talk about those in a moment for us. So in our audience's feeling, is it not enough time? Is a lack of patient understanding, a lack of patient retention of information? Um, is it because the practitioner is more focused on legal versus the ethical obligation? Are there other issues that might also impact that? So just a reminder, we, are, we have Q&A uh, feature available to you on the right side of your screen. If you have any questions for any of our speakers or any concepts you'd like, please feel free to write those questions to us during the webinar. We are, again, collecting all the submitted questions, and we'll address as many as we can at the end of our session. So um, our polls are almost closing, so please get your entries in when you can. Uh, Dr. Braddock is going to be talking about some of these challenges, and it's really good for us to kind of see how our audience thinks the key factors play in. We, again, know there are many challenges. Time, obviously, is one of the keys. Um, and we do have our results, and the polls are closed. Interesting for me to see that it's kind of a balance between not enough time as well as the need to focus on legal. That is an interesting balance there. So let us turn then to uh, Dr. Braddock, who can discuss these issues for us. Dr. Braddock will share his perspectives on informed consent in the actual practice. He'll discuss the role of shared decision-making, which Dr. Beecham has introduced us to, um, and how that shared decision-making can enhance treatment discussions. And Dr. Braddock will also introduce us to a number of models that physicians and practitioners can use in their daily practices. So, Dr. Braddock, let me start with you, your first question. Uh, we know you spent significant time studying physician-patient communication, especially as it relates to medical decision-making. From your research, how effective have you found the typical informed consent discussion to be? Well, it's a great question, Brad. You know, it's interesting looking at the poll results and seeing how the, the, the uh, audience is thinking about this question. It certainly resonates with my own experience. I got interested in this as a research question really all the way back in med school when I recall being asked by the resident to go consent a patient for surgery. And I wasn't quite sure what that meant, and I asked what am I supposed to do, and they said, well, just go tell the patient what we're going to do and get them to sign the form. And it's then I really began to see over the rest of my career this gap between the ideal of informed consent and what was happening in practice. 
a lot of the early research looking at this question would use surveys. They'd ask patients, first they'd ask physicians, you know, did you talk to the patient about the alternatives and the risks? And, of course, the physician says, sure, yeah, absolutely. And by that kind of research, it looks like docs are doing a pretty good job. When you survey patients, you'd find that patients gave a much different story, that, that in fact, they weren't being informed about all the risks and benefits and alternatives or really being involved in the decision. And uh, with some colleagues, we decided the way to sort of you know, figure out who was right was actually observe encounters. So we started to audio tape actual audio uh, uh, office visits using criteria like what are shown on this slide. And we got coders to listen to these audio recordings and, and find out, did the physician discuss the patient's role, the nature of the decision, alternatives, benefits and risks, uncertainties? Did they assess the patient's understanding? Did they listen to listen the patient's preferences? And what we found was, was pretty striking. The next slide shows uh, our analysis based by different types of decisions. Basic decisions were things like getting a routine laboratory test or imaging study. Intermediate decisions were things like a new medication. Complex decisions were things like surgery. And what we did on the, on the uh, y-axis is the percent of those uh, visits that we audio recorded that met criteria for complete informed decision making. And as you can see, the results are pretty, pretty poor. Uh, for basic decisions, about 17%. None of the intermediate decisions met criteria for informed uh, consent. And the complex decisions, only one out of the 213 that we analyzed met the criteria. Now, we delved into this a little bit deeper, as is shown on the next slide, looking at, by those same uh, categories, uh, looking at specific elements uh, shown by each of the bars. So, for example, uh, the tallest bar, the nature of the decision, you know, physicians did a pretty good job letting the patient know what was being decided. However, for most of the other elements of informed decision-making, we found performance, again, was very poor. And, in fact, back to Dr. Beecham's comments about understanding, across the board, understanding was the least well-practiced, that physicians rarely, if ever, uh, explored the patient's understanding of the decision. Dr. Braddock, it seems very clear then just from those findings that we really need to, to reassess this informed consent process and decide what is working and what isn't. We discussed a moment ago with Dr. Beecham the potential distracting effects of conducting medical decision-making simply by reference to legal standards or institutional requirements. Um, so let's, I want to ask you, can you give us some of your observations of the challenges that need to be addressed? Well, first off, Brad, I would, I would completely agree. I think that there is this distraction. I recall, recall years ago giving a talk to a group of physicians about this topic, and I started off the talk asking them, what sort of like word association. What do you think of when you hear the term informed consent? And they said things like a form you have to get signed, something you have to do to keep from getting sued. No one talked about this notion of a dialogue. And I think as we think about that, that there is this gap. Now, when you start, you know, sort of talking with physicians about sort of the realities of practice, going back to your original question, I think, you know, people bring up lots of very common things. It's probably the most common is time. This is all well and good, Dr. Braddock, but, you know, who has the time for these long conversations? The second most common challenge I think that comes up is, it was re referred to earlier, and that is whether patients really can or we should try to have them understand. Who wants to give a patient a, a mini lecture in medicine? They can't possibly understand what we do. Uh, there are some legitimate concerns about uh, health literacy and numeracy, and, and we know there's a high proportion of our population that has uh, challenges in those areas. And finally, some patients aren't actually sure they want to participate, nor are they accustomed to. Uh, so you know, I think in some sense, patients need to be activated, and there's a lot of research on how to help patients come into the clinical encounter activated and empowered to participate. So I think as you think about these challenges, you realize that, uh, you know, there's a lot more work to, to be done before we get to this ideal of shared decision-making. Uh, Dr. Braddock, thank you. Uh, one thing I find interesting is we often can see only one side or the other, but what we really see is there are numerous challenges for both the physician and the patient. So let me go to my next question then. Over the past decade, um, I know you've been one of the advocates for this term we've used already called shared decision making as a framework which might be used to assist the medical practitioner in achieving ethically valid informed consent discussions. So let's move to that then. Can you define what shared decision making is and also explain how it can address some of the challenges you've just identified? Sure thing, Brad. I think the next slide shows you know, a quote from one of the uh, leading authors on this topic of, of shared decision making. And as you can see, that the concept, and Dr. Beecham kind of referred to this already, is that shared decision making is about a bi-directional dialogue between patient and clinician. 
the goal of which is to have the patient become an informed participant in decision-making. There's an emphasis on providing information about alternatives, but also exploring the patient's preferences and values, not just giving them information and asking them to sign a form, but having a bi-directional uh, interchange. The next slide, I think, shows a little bit more of this contrast between the, the sort of the legal model of informed consent and this uh, sort of dialogic model of shared decision-making. Informed consent is about unilateral disclosure. Shared decision-making is about a, a bi-directional dialogue, the goal of which is not just to get the patient to consent, but to get the patient to be an informed participant in decision-making. Informed consent relies on the physician's knowledge, and physicians are often motivated, as we heard earlier, by this notion of trying, trying to protect uh, against legal liability, where shared decision-making recognizes the physician has some knowledge, but you can provide patients with the information to be an informed participant through many, many uh, avenues, including the use of decision aids, which we'll talk about later. And finally, at its core, again, it's about exploring the patient's needs, their values and preferences, and adapting the final decision to something that's a, that's a, a combination of the physician's recommendation and that that makes sense to the patient's values and preferences. As you look on the next slide at sort of the elements of shared decision-making, a lot of similarities to informed consent, but a few important differences. There is the need, first of all, to explore the patient's desired role. Uh, research so shows that at least two-thirds to three-quarters of patients want to have a role in medical decision-making, but some small percentage would rather defer to the physician. There's no way to find that out other than to explore it with individual patient. Second is this notion of uh, what things to discuss, and again, very similar to informed consent. The patient needs to know some minimum, minimal information about the nature, alternatives, risks, and benefits, and uncertainties, but importantly, to also explore the impact of the, on the context of the patient's life. Someone who's about to undergo knee surgery, for example, needs to know how long they're going to be out of work. Uh, is it important that their uh, house has stairs? And what should they be thinking about in that context? Probing the patient's understanding is very important. It's not enough just to provide the information, but if the patient's going to be an informed participant, the physician must find out if they have sufficient information. Allowing the patient to solicit input from trusted others. Uh, family members, a primary care physician, and finally, eliciting the patient's thoughts and preferences about the desired decision. Excellent, Dr. Braddock. So it seems clear to me that there is a difference in how the shared decision-making model goes about the process of getting informed consent in comparison to the traditional approach. So my next question is, what is the feedback from facilities, from practitioners, and from patients who have participated in shared decision-making? Uh, stated a different way, why would a practitioner or facility, or a patient for that matter, consider participating in a shared decision-making process? Yeah, I think this is where, Brad, the, the research and, and writing in this area has really added uh, further emphasis to the importance of shared decision-making. As Dr. Beecham uh, pointed out, I think, very well, uh, there is this sort of strong ethical rationale. There's a legal thing in the background, but the ethical rationale of sort of doing the right thing. But there's a growing body of research of, of, of uh, to support doing shared decision-making. Research showing, as I mentioned, that most patients really want to be informed uh, and want to be involved in decision-making, uh, recognizing that there are uh, ways to identify and deal with health literacy needs of patients. We find that patients uh, who are engaged in shared decision-making have more accurate perception of risk. We also find better adherence to medication. So if patients are involved and sort of buy into the decision, uh, they're more likely to sort of follow through with it. That, that box that says um, uh, better decision quality is a really interesting construct. Decision quality is a combination of uh, the patient's you know, knowledge about the decision, uh, their um, uh, sort of ability to sort of articulate what it means to them, uh, the, the way in which it aligns with their values and preferences, and their satisfaction with the decision when it's made. And we're finding more and more research showing that good quality shared decision making leads to better quality decisions. It also increases trust, patient satisfaction. Physicians are more satisfied and actually perform better in, uh, in looking at outcome performance. And, un and fundamentally, there's better treatment outcomes with shared decision making. Interestingly, there's some uh, newer research that shows that patients who engage in shared decision making may actually be less likely to choose more expensive and more complex medical procedures, particularly in cases where those procedures have a, a softer indication, and also an association between shared decision-making and reducing uh, malpractice claims. Interesting, Dr. Braddock. It, it's certainly better outcomes and greater satisfaction for both physicians and patients. Those are certainly results I think everybody can appreciate. Uh, 
Um, to me, it, it looks like shared decision making clearly does have a growing promise uh, and a growing use. Um, so let's switch now to some of the practical aspects. What are some of the techniques that a medical practitioner can use to put this concept into practice? Yeah, I think this is one of the challenging things for physicians in practice and, and other clinicians, and I'll just give a couple of uh, examples of things that people might do. The next slide shows something called the control preference scale. This has been used a lot in research, but I would suggest that clinicians think about using this or something like it to explore the, 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 the desires and the parts of their patients for different roles in decision-making. As you can see here, some patients may select A, the active role. They really want to sort of be the driver of decision-making. Others may be on the other end of the spectrum, really want to defer to the physician. Uh, others may prefer sort of the middle ground, the more collaborative role. But by uh, some practices have actually started using uh, scales like this when patients come to the clinic practice, finding out what's their desired way to make decisions. And it can be very valuable to sort of guide how you're going to approach things with that individual patient. Another tool shown in the next slide is a, is a, a simple sort of approach, which we call Ask, Tell, Ask. And this is a way of sort of breaking down shared decision-making into just sort of three main components. First, on the next slide, is ask. Starting off with an exploration of what does the patient already know about the decision? Uh, how would they like to make decisions? You might say, for example, some patients like to hear everything before making decisions. Uh, others just want the highlights. Help me understand how you'd like to make decisions. That can be very helpful to setting the stage so you can you know, meet the patient at their level of information. Some come in, they're already pretty well informed. Others, it's brand new and they need to start from scratch. Once you've now established that baseline, the next slide, slide shows uh, you know, how to basically sort of start to provide that information to get the patient uh, to participate. So providing unbiased information, match their level of literacy, talk about ways that other patients have dealt with the decision, but fundamentally the frame that you really want this to be a shared decision. So, for example, I'd like us to decide this together. Or some patients like treatment A, give example of reasons. Others like treatment B, give an example of reasons. By providing that, it sort of normalizes the fact that patients decide things differently, and you can then ask the patient which way they're leaning. Finally, on the next slide, you then sort of start to clarify the patient's values and preferences, make sure the decision fits that patient's values, and sort of confirm that that's where, we, where the direction you're going to head. Um, you mentioned earlier that, you're, that being able to travel abroad is important to you. Let's explore how that decision may affect that. These are the kinds of questions that may really help to align the final decision with that unique, that patient's unique sort of situation. And finally, just to see that we understand uh, their level of understanding. The 5A model is another tool that can be used to, uh, uh, and this just shows what the 5A stand for. But again, I offer it to people to uh, consider as a, as a you know, sort of useful tool to sort of shape these conversations. Assess the health condition, advise regarding benefits, harms, alternatives, agree on preferences, assist, and then arrange follow-up. A few other tools which I'll just mention on the next slide include things like uh, the teach-back method, a way of assessing understanding. And this, the clinician will say to the patient, just to make sure I did a good job of explaining that, why don't you tell back to me what you heard me say? And that way you can find out if they really understood it, if they really kind of got the gist of it, or if there are gaps that you need to readdress. Another is the notion of two-visit discussions. Sometimes a decision is so uh, complex, you may need to talk about it a little bit now, provide the patient with some materials to read or reflect on, and have them come back in another visit to decide, particularly for complex, for example, surgical decisions. And finally, decision aids. Decision aids are high-quality, evidence-based resources that provide patients with, in with information in an unbiased manner, begin to explore the values and preferences, and provide a wonderful preparation for the patient to come into the visit, prepared to engage in a deeper conversation with the physician about their ultimate treatment choice. Thank you, Dr. Braddock. Uh, this really does give us a better understanding of how the shared decision model works as well as uh, I would love having these various techniques that can be incorporated into the actual daily practice. Uh, and now I want to turn to our audience with our next poll question. As Dr. Braddock just mentioned, one of the components of shared decision-making is the use of decision aids. Um, let's open up the polls now and ask our audience, what value do you think decision aids can bring to medical decision-making? Uh, can they educate the patient about their condition, uh, improve the patient's understanding of risks, substitute it would be a substitute for the informed consent discussion. Uh, would the most important aspect be protecting the physician from a claim based upon a lack of informed consent discussion? Um, these are all values that we're asking you to kind of place on that. What you think would probably be the most important in terms of a use of a decision aid as part of an informed consent discussion? Uh, 
just as a reminder, please send us your questions um, through our Q&A feature on the right side of your screen. Again, we will attempt to address as many questions as we can, depending upon our time. And we appreciate all of your input. Uh, we're just about closing our poll on this question. Uh, give us an opportunity then to next turn to Dr. Sobel, who's going to talk about a number of the technological aspects of this. Fascinating. Our polls are closed. Uh, improving patient understanding of the risks is our highest percentage, and that's excellent because that's exactly where we are leading next to. So, Dr. Sobel, let me turn to you. Uh, Dr. Sobel is going to provide us some perspectives on these technological tools that can be used. So, Dr. Sobel, from your view, and perhaps in reference to your experience as a, a practicing surgeon, as well as a CMO of Emmy, what has been your experience with shared decision making, and what are the key issues facing the practitioner and the patient that can be helped by the use of modern media? Uh, well, again, let me thank you for including me in today's conversation. And uh, I would start by mirroring a lot of what Dr. Braddock said, especially going back to the beginning of my training. Um, I started my I started my uh, uh, surgical residency on a Friday, and my first day of call was on a Sunday. And as I prepared patients for surgery for Monday, the single goal of the informed consent process was to get the signature on the form. And uh, I, I, I very quickly realized that that was empty in a lot of ways, and uh, became very passionate about the informed consent process. Uh, I've come to believe there are significant benefits, and I think we've seen those already today in the engaged and activated patient. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, later, in that intern later in that internship year, I was rotating on a general surgery service in a hospital, and I went in to see a patient, and, and as luck would have it, the patient's wife was somebody who my team had treated earlier when I was doing uh, a rotation on cardiothoracic surgery. And you need to understand, I'm a surgical intern, and I'm a surgical intern in urology. I know nothing about the actual practice of cardiothoracic surgery. And this patient comes up to the attending who I'm walking around, and she says to him, you must be very lucky. You have the chance to work with Dr. Sobel. He's the best heart surgeon in the city. And again, I was the last person you would want to operate on your heart. But because I took the time to talk with her and really engage in not just the informed consent process, but how it evolves into the shared decision-making process, her perception was that I was the best. And so I think there's great power in, in, in a physician who takes the time and really does do a, a, a shared decision-making protocol. Now, as far as Dr. Sobel, if I could just ask you just also to speak up again. We're talking about technolo technology. <laughs> we want to make sure it all works for all of our audience. So just speak clearly into the phone. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I, I will do my best here. Uh, as far as the challenges of, uh, that technology can address, first and foremost, time. As a physician, I will see 35. Uh, I will see 35 patients in a clinic. Uh, time is precious, and it's being uh, it's being pressed at, at, at every opportunity. And if there's a technology that can help pre-educate a patient and lay the foundation so that my conversation with them can focus on their specific concerns, uh, that is a wonderful benefit. Certainly, literacy and language. You want uh, uh, tools that can help uh, physicians cross those barriers. Also, cultural barriers as well uh, are, are, are incredibly helpful. Uh, a lot of physicians are very concerned about the what they call the Dr. Google problem. Patients who come in with with uh, uh, extensive internet searches. I, I actually encourage my patients to to look on the internet. I want them to be educated, but if I can direct them to resources uh, that are that are vetted and that I know are high quality, it allows for a much better conversation. The last thing I want to touch upon is is a term I use, and, and I didn't coin this, but I do use it the disease of familiarity. And I'll give you the, the best example. Um, I just went through my numbers recently. I'm approaching approximately 1,000 vasectomies in my career. And although I'm passionate about the informed consent process, certainly uh, the, uh, my passion with that very first patient as I discussed the procedure is very different than the 1,000th patient. Uh, and and, and that's, that's to be expected. It's the same story that I'm telling over and over again. Unfortunately for the patient, it's their one and only vasectomy. They're brand new to it. So, again, if there are tools that can help lay foundation so I can focus our conversation around their specific concerns, there, there, there's great benefit in that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sobel. So uh, I think we'll just launch into the basics then. How do these multimedia decision aids like Emmy, how do they work? Can you explain that to us? Why don't we move forward to the next slide? 
Uh, there's lots of different uh, decision aids that are out there. I'll, I'll speak specifically to ours, but again, there are lots of different aids that are available. Uh, first and foremost, in, in this instance, it's prescribed information. A physician will issue an access code that is particular to a patient. Um, the information is uh, consumed uh, uh, certainly over the Internet. There's been a lot of focus on mobile devices. And uh, probably what I think is the most important thing in this aspect is accepting that uh, when, you, when you interact with the patient, it's not just the patient, it's their whole community around them. So we truly encourage patients to, um, uh, to share their access codes with friends and family. You know, prior to surgery, oftentimes, uh, it's me with a patient. After surgery, it's me with a family. And unfortunately, complications do occur. The worst time to discuss the risk of surgery with somebody is after the complication has occurred. And unfortunately, oftentimes when the daughter flies in from, uh, from across the country and unfortunately there is a complication, the first time the physician gets to talk with that family member, they're, they're starting that whole education process all over again. And if we could reach out to that family member and share with them information before the procedure, there's great value in that. Uh, uh, at Emmy, we do track the interactive conversation that's documented and cataloged. We've, we've taken great, uh, uh, great time and energy to do that in a uh, in a manner so it could be admitted into uh, into evidence in the event there is a lawsuit and in the event a patient says, "I didn't know. Nobody ever told me." Now, as far as uh, as far as the design elements of of our tools, first and foremost, there's visual learning. We spend a lot of time creating our animations, uh, and it's very important. We, we want things to be anatomically accurate without being so realistic as to, as to uh, create anxiety. And uh, again, there's great power in this. I have a partner of mine who uh, uh, has always struggled trying to describe what a communicating hydrocele is to, uh, to a parent. And once you show it, uh, certainly they get it. it. It's something they can certainly understand, but it's very difficult to just to, to, to discuss it. It needs to be visualized. Uh, our programs are narrated. There's a lot of energy placed in creating an empathetic voice to give the illusion that you're communicating with a person and not a computer. Uh, uh, interactivity, the ability to stop a program at any time, ask a question, and that question be forwarded to, to the physician. So it's that bi-directional, that back and forth. If you're going to interact with the program, it needs to have intuitive uh, navigation as well. So something that is easy for anybody to step up to and, uh, and be able to utilize the program. Excellent. That's a great description. Thank you, Dr. Soto, of, of how these work. Um, I think I'd like to switch just briefly now for you to – uh, what types of technology, what types of decision aids are available uh, out in the market? I think we'd benefit from having you give just a few minutes on, on that concept. Again, there's, there's a myriad of different technologies that are available. Uh, uh, there's a, a number of different products that physicians can utilize. For instance, there are surgery-specific consent forms. There are tools that allow physicians to actually modify consent forms uh, for specific patients. There's, there's some excellent physician vetted resources on the internet. Uh, most associations, many hospital now, hospitals now spend a lot of time creating, uh, wonderful resources, uh, on the internet available to patients. Interactive voice response, reaching out to the patient and, uh, and having automated, uh, automated messaging to, uh, to stay connected and to, uh, uh, to really communicate along the continuum of care. And it's more than just telling the patient that they have an appointment with their doctor tomorrow, but to reach out and talk about uh, uh, reminding the diabetic to check, uh, to check their foot ulcer, uh, uh, reminding the, uh, the, the, the patient with congestive heart failure to go ahead and, uh, and weigh themselves each day and, and, and reach back to their physician. Uh, probably the most exciting area where I see a lot of growth is in social medicine. And this is the acceptance that uh, the most underutilized resource in medicine are the patients themselves. Uh, it used to be the Wild West, a lot of patients going online, uh, uh, posting their experience, and, and no one really knew what to trust. But there's a lot of energy and effort in, in a number of good websites that are really focusing on directing that conversation and really um, allowing patients to communicate on their experience and allowing patients to communicate with each other. Uh, 
the one thing I would add here is that technology oftentimes allows itself to self-correct, uh, and, and in, in each of these in each of these different avenues. Um, the best example I can give you, uh, at Emmy, we have a library of content. And every year we go uh, to the shelf and we dust off our content and we look at it. We want to make sure it's medically accurate. We want to make sure it's complete. But part of the process is we look at the questions that come through. What are patients asking their doctors? What can we do better in the program? And a, a great small example is in the LASIK eye surgery program, we had a lot of female patients asking about when can they wear eye makeup. And we went to our medical advisors and we said, are you hearing this? And the doctor said, well, no, we don't hear that at all. And we said, oh, well, then maybe it's not that important. Meanwhile, the office staff took us and said, we're getting 15 phone calls a day. Could you please talk about this? And when we updated the information in our program, uh, uh, those, those phone calls went away. And so for the ability of technology to go and, and self-regulate and self-correct, I think is, is a wonderful aspect of it as well. Dr. Stobel, thank you. Uh, it, it's very fascinating to me. You've described essentially what the decision age look like. Uh, you've given us a brief overview of what's out there. I guess the big, big next question then is, does it work? Have you uh, seen any results from your own research which show that these, in fact, do add value to the organizations that have implemented this kind of technology? Uh, certainly. Uh, on the next slide, uh, there's, there's a chart there. Uh, we've done a number of different studies with our partners. Uh, we've had studies that show uh, uh, programs increase patient satisfaction, they decrease length of hospitalization, they can decrease the surgery cancellation rate. This one here focuses, though, on, on patient comprehension. And if you look on the horizontal, as, uh, uh, horizontal axis, uh, it, there are numbers going from 20 to 40. These researchers uh, uh, were measuring patient comprehension, and, and you can see a control group, and then you can see a group that were given an, an, an ME program. And those patients with ME programs uh, who had experienced an ME program skew to the right, and that's to say their comprehension numbers were much higher. In fact, if you look at a comprehension scale of 40, patients who saw ME were three times more likely to have that score than if they did not. Um, so that's incredibly encouraging. Now, there's a take home on this as well. These researchers defined a 40 as sort of the, it wasn't an A-plus rating, it's sort of the B. They, they, they had enough information to uh, to uh, adequately uh, be, uh, to adequately, adequately uh, um, uh, obtain an informed consent. Uh, certainly there's more room. Certainly there are patients, even in the ME group, that, that fell uh, just, just shy of that 40. And so uh, it's encouraging to see, and it's also motivation to, uh, to keep working forward. Excellent, Dr. Stubble. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. This has given us a very good overview of the value as well as the use of decision aids. Um, in a moment for our audience, we're going to move to our question and answer period. But first, I want to thank all three of our, our panelists for what has been, a, to me, certainly a very interesting and illuminating discussion on reassessing how informed consent is obtained, certainly as we move forward in the modern medical field, the, the era of reform. Uh, Dr. Braddock, Dr. Beecham, Dr. Sobel, I want to thank all three of you um, for participating. And again, in a moment, we are moving to our question and answer session. Um, I do want to remind our audience, uh, please don't forget to download and review our Reconstructing Informed Consent Toolkit. This toolkit includes an extensive white paper that goes into much more detail on these subjects than we could discuss in an hour today. Uh, the instructions for the download were provided in your registration email. If you're unable to access the toolkit, please contact risk management at stanfordmed.org. Uh, we'd also like you to please save the date uh, for participating in our next, next Edge of Risk series webinar. This will be on physician wellness and burnout. That will be scheduled at a date in November of this year. So let me turn now just to, uh, in a little bit of time we have from uh, remaining to a couple questions. And Dr. Beecham, I'm going to give you, uh, we received a number of questions. I'm going to give you one of, I think, one of the more difficult ones. Um, the question is, um, if you're dealing with a terminally ill patient or a relative on life support, there are both legal and ethical issues that play in there. And I, we, the questioner just asked them that you have any thoughts about how to go about dealing with the terminally ill discussion, both legally and ethically. Um, is, is the idea that there might be something different in the informed consent context? I think the question, yes, is whether or not there are, there are additional issues for the patient and family that deal with a, a terminally ill situation. Well, there are going to be additional issues or specific issues uh, whenever you shift the context. But I, I think we're pretty much over the days – 
when we thought there was a really critical difference between the terminally ill and those who are not terminally ill. Our responsibilities don't shift. The informed consent context doesn't shift. There, there may be a few extraneous cases where you want to protect the patient a little bit more than you would otherwise interact more with the family and so on, but that's not necessarily confined to um, the terminally ill. So I, I, I would say that it's an overrated idea, although it definitely has a, a history that the terminally ill should be treated in a different fashion. To put it bluntly, they ought not to be treated in a different fashion. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beecham. Um, Dr. Braddock, let me go to you with our next question. Um, obviously, we know time is one of the key factors. And the question asks, how do you work in the two-visit consent process you talked about where time for the patient as well as the physician is clearly an issue? Yeah, actually, just one brief comment on the last question. I would say that you know, one of the things I find useful in the uh, hospitalized patient, terminal ill or terminal illness or something like that, is really this idea of exploring the patient and family sort of baseline understanding. Sometimes patients really have a sense that they, they know that they're seriously ill or that the end is near. Sometimes they don't, and that can be a very good opening. On this two-visit consent, I, can, I think to answer the question, the notion is that you may not have sufficient time in the office visit to provide that sort of initial assessment of the patient's knowledge, provide information, assess understanding, talk about some of the nuances, and then make a decision. And if you're not pressed to make the decision right at that instant, it might be better to sort of start the first conversation, the first visit, with framing the decision. Well, you know, we might consider, you know, you know, these options. You might need surgery on your knee, or maybe we could try just medications. Let's talk about that for a second. What are your initial thoughts? Here's some information that we might have you read, or here's a decision aid, something I'd like you to take a look at. And when you come back next time, let's talk about what questions you have, respond to those, and with the goal of making a decision. Then at the second visit, you can say, oh, so how did you find that uh, video disc that you watched, or how did you, you know, find the website that, you, that I had you go to? Find out what the patient learned, what questions they have, a product like, uh, like Dr. Sobel's that, that sort of cues you with what kinds of questions the patient has is a starting point for that second conversation. And then you're able to sort of get to, well, now that you've read all that or watched the video or what have you, let's sort of figure out where you're leaning in terms of surgery versus medical therapy. So something like that I think is what he had in mind. Now, obviously, you have to have multiple visits for that, but the intervening time between those visits is a time for the patient to really actively be learning the information that they need to be an informed participant, to be checking in with, with friends and family members, maybe checking in with their primary care physician, to do all those things that are, are really placing that decision in the context of their life. Thank you, Dr. Braddock. That actually leads uh, into um, one of our next questions. And Dr. Sobel, I want to I wanna address this to you. Um, the question asks, are there decision aids for senior citizens or elderly who may not be able to utilize computers or the technology, but they still want to be personally involved in the decision-making? There, again, there's, there's numerous different decision aids that are out there. There's some wonderful printed forms. Uh, there are, there's absolutely uh, um, materials that can be handed to the patient, but I, I don't want to undercut the use of technology for the, for the elderly. Uh, when we uh, started the company, that was one of our biggest concerns, and we heard that from a number of our participants. But there's there's no group of people getting online faster and having access than the elderly. Um, uh, certainly, there are exceptions to that, but uh, we have a number of physicians who have who are using our technology in the office themselves and are just teeing it up for their patients in in a free room. We have family members who are teeing it up for uh, for their parents uh, as well. So uh, I, I, I don't want to just relegate uh, the elderly to, uh, to people who can't or don't have access to technology, but certainly there are workarounds for that, and certainly there are printed forms and, and, and different information available to patients uh, that doctors can utilize in their office. And I, I just want to – I actually want to agree with what Dr. Braddock just said. Uh, in my practice, it's rare for me to ever have a situation where I would say to a patient, uh, you know, I'm free today at 3.30, we better go, uh, and we have to go now. Uh, the discussion around uh, how to treat a, a, a disease state um, is oftentimes protracted, and to start the conversation around uh, medication or surgical intervention, to have them follow up, to give them the tools so they can learn more about it and get them thinking about the different processes, 
uh, is very valuable. And when they come back, again, they're more engaged, they're ready, they uh, uh, they want to move forward. So I think it's a rare instance where I find myself in a situation having to very quickly uh, uh, discuss with a patient and get them towards uh, towards a surgical intervention. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Beecham, I'd like to address the next question to you. Um, interesting one because you talked a little bit about this earlier. The question is, um, clinic nurses are often bringing the consent form for the signature when there's only been a very brief description from the doctor. And the question asks, do we focus too much on just getting a form signed? Um. Well, certainly, traditionally, we focus on it too much, and um, I, um, I think that we still have a long way to go on this score. I would say the basic answer to the question is yes. We focus way too much on that and way too little on other things. And I, I can give you, and I'm sure everybody on this call can give you cases that they've seen uh, repeatedly in the hallways of hospitals and the like where a, a consent form is purely pro forma, it doesn't bear any resemblance to actually obtaining an informed consent. So, yes, I would say um, that's, that's the correct answer. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Braddock, let me address this next question to you. The question asks, how do you handle pushback from doctors who don't want to sign off on informed consent forms? Um, often physicians may say they've documented in the H&P, and therefore they don't really have to sign off on anything involving cons actual consent discussion. How would you address that question? Yeah, that's a tough one. I think you know, part of you know, the, what the physician may be you know, thinking is that the, the process, the conversation with the patient, um, reaching a shared decision is, is like the most important thing. And if that's where they're coming from, I think there's something to be said for that. And it does sort of point out this, this rather arbitrary distinction between the process of shared decision making that is reaching a decision and this notion that for certain types of decisions that sort of by law we're required to get a, a signature authorization and, you know, rightly or wrongly that's sort of the, uh, the, the world in which we live. I would say that, you know, back to that prior question, that the consent form signed is, of course, minimally uh, of minimal uh, sort of baseline importance. It's great to have it in place. But if it's in place and it hasn't been preceded by a robust conversation, hopefully that can be documented in a medical record, then, then that's really not of much value. I would say to the physician who's, who's re reluctant to sign the form that that's actually the easiest part of the consent process, the more, the more uh, you know, challenging part, at least in terms of time and, and some of the challenges that we talked about earlier, is the process that precedes it. So I don't think that there's much, uh, uh, you know, uh, intrinsic value in the signature, but it is something that's, you know, that we really have to have, so I would encourage people to just go ahead and do it. Dr. Braddock, I, I think we have time just for one more question. I'd like to address it to you. Um, an interesting question. What would you do in a situation where a patient accepts some portions of the consent discussion but doesn't like other portions, either the discussion or the form? How would you handle that? Yeah, this is one we hear a lot. I mean, sort of the, uh, sort of, you know, uh, all or none sort of consent and I think it sometimes depends on the, on the circumstance. There, there are uh, medical interventions where it does make sense to sort of break it into parts, but there are others where it makes sense to, um, where it doesn't make sense to do so. So if, for example, the uh, patient's going to undergo surgery to, to have surgery X, uh, and then the surgeon might say, but in case we find, you know, these other findings, we may want to be able to, to you know, remove your, your spleen or, or, or whatever. Uh, and, you know, patients may uh, push back on that. And I would say that the, the key to sort of navigating that is going through this process and making sure you understand the patient's reason. So I would ask the patient, I noticed that you're hesitant for this part of it. Let me know a little bit more about what your reluctance is. You may find out that they just have some very legitimate reason for declining that portion of it. Or you may find out more likely that the patient has a misunderstanding or lack of understanding of why this might, might be necessary. Uh, at the end of the day, though, once you've assured yourself that the patient has an informed understanding of, you know, uh, of what you're proposing and has at least a, 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 a rational reason for wanting to decline part of it, then it's up to the physician to decide whether they're comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable with sort of allowing the patient to sort of carve out a part of that procedure uh, out of the consent form, then maybe it's not, you're not at a point where it's, where it's prudent to move forward. But at the end of the day, the patient does have to, have to consent, have to provide autonomous authorization, to use Dr. Beeson's phrase, to that the entire procedure. 
So I would say that, you know, really that, that reluctance on the patient's part means you have to have more dialogue. Interesting, Dr. Braddock, and I think we're going to um, end our question and answer right now due to time, but I do think it's fascinating that we ended on this concept uh, which we've talked about the entire hour, and that is the goal is to have an actual dialogue, a back-and-forth communication between patient and physician. That is the goal for all of us. Uh, for our audience, if time does, has not allowed us to address your question, you may submit the questions to our email address at riskmanagement at stanfordmed.org, and we will do our best to provide you with written responses. Uh, I want to thank our three uh, panelists, Dr. Beecham, Dr. Braddock, and Dr. Sobel. Excellent talk today, and we really appreciate it. To our audience, I thank you very much for all attending. Please take a moment to complete our survey when you log off. This will conclude today's webinar. For further questions, if you would like to contact Stanford Risk Consulting, please email us at riskmanagement at stanfordmed.org. We thank you again, and you may now disconnect.